Uh, let's start with this uh, conference by Mark McKay of feeding and neutral approach. I immediately <laughs> give the floor to Professor Angelo Maggi, which is a, a professor in architectural history, also responsible for the international uh, uh, relation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll move here. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me being here for this occasion uh, because I, uh, not only for the role that I have at the university for uh, is a rector for international relations, but also because I've met uh, Mark BK before in another lecture, which was uh, really interesting. It was a, a very uh, interesting approach to integral uh, way of looking at the topic. But uh, today we will have uh, a special lecture on that, which is much more in his, uh, you know, um, Professor DK is uh, a specialist, but is also at the University of Tennessee, which we would love to have an agreement with in return, and uh, an agreement which uh, is already fruitful because uh, he's like a guest visiting professor here for many times. So there's a liaison next to me, and uh, well, uh, looking at his incredible 13 pages of CV, we can understand that uh, for Professor DK, the concept of sustainable design is related in a very uh, different approach. So, and uh, I don't know, I think that today's lecture is going to be a very interesting thing because, uh, you know, knowing that uh, Mark DK has devoted his entire life, I have to say, to this uh, analysis of design, sustainable design and an integral you know, a way of uh, looking at it. I think that today's lecture, which is forming, feeding an integral approach, I'm very curious of uh, uh, being here. I'm going to be listening very carefully, maybe putting some notes down and I'm obviously asking questions. I hope you do the same. But the last thing I'd like to say that we need also to remind, uh, you know, Member that he's also a Fulbright specialist. This is my last thing, the last thing I'd like to say. Uh, Fulbright has been uh, a very important uh, connection with countries, so uh, paying for bursaries and fellowships for very important people. So he's not only a specialist, but he's also someone who has uh, had benefit from Fulbright. And uh, I think there are a lot of connections here, even today. I think my role here, I was really happy when Margarita said, can you come and open uh, you know, this conference? I said, yes, of course I'll do it because I'm really devoted to whoever has won a full ride. And as it happened to this guy, who so George Evans. So thank you for being here. Thank you to Margarita for organizing this. I hope you will be enjoying it very special occasion, it's a fantastic thing, and uh, uh, thanks to Mark, and I'll leave you the floor, okay? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Angelo, um, for that generous introduction. I, uh, last time uh, we spoke, you introduced me to another interesting character in a book. Can you hear? Ah. Uh, is this better? Even closer. Yeah. Uh, this should be challenging. <laughs> I was just uh, thanking uh, Angelo for his introduction and saying that uh, last time we met, uh, he introduced me to one another of his favorite authors. So I'll, I'll have to get the references that you mentioned earlier. Uh, he always uh, takes me back to things that um, I didn't know about that have already been done, when, and I, I love that. Uh, so welcome, buongiorno. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm so excited and happy to be here. And thank you to you, Av, and to Professor Venore and Iridi for hosting me, and also to Stefano for chairing today and being such an excellent host in general in my visit. 
And I also uh, want to acknowledge the U.S. Fulbright program for providing some funding. So I'm excited to show you some work today from a new book, some new work that's been going on for quite some time. And I have this idea that academics initially become passionate about something because they do not understand that topic. And that was totally true for me in this case. I'm always looking and studying in my career for uh, something and being inspired by something that I do not know about, something I don't know about buildings and cities, which is a lot. And this morning, I'll tell you a little bit about some of those questions and struggles over the past years to make sense of this elusive subject, this idea of the experience of architecture. So back as far as 1996, I was working on two editions of this book, Sun, Wind and Light, Architectural Design Strategies. For the students in the group, you, you've seen a little bit of that work that I might have posted for you. Uh, it's now two volumes, uh, over 800 pages and really 20 years worth of, of efforts. And it's organized, this is just by way of, of, of introduction to say where I've been and how I got to, to thinking about this new topic. So there's more than 100 design strategies like this one uh, that are about the buildings, in this case, the building's organization for natural ventilation. It also deals with all kinds of climate and net zero and things like that. And so for 25 years or so, I pursued this technological path to sustainable design. We were looking at architectural space and form and how that influences energy use. And these are tools that the designer can use to help them make choices, such as this one, which is conceptual organizations for plan and section to how to promote good airflow in the building. So it was a very architectural approach to building technology and performance. It turns out that this energy driven technological approach is a very hard sell to architects and to students. And so I began to look for other complementary approaches for how to design with nature. And this took another four years of concerted effort and resulted in another book, which uh, Suzanne, my wife, who's sitting here, was the uh, editor and partner for. Uh, it, we called it Integral Sustainable Design, Transformative Perspectives. And this was the work that, uh, the kind of work that connected me with Professor Vonore and her integral approach. And last spring, I collaborated with four colleagues from around the world on a series of online lectures for you of, and you can find more about the integral model and applications to various design topics in these lectures. Um, they're on my YouTube channel. I like mine a little bit better than you of's because I went and edited a bit. So I suggest you go there. And Suzanne and I also uh, uh, led three months of workshops for researchers and master's students here at U of. We had a great time online last year. So in this book, I was developing 16 different viewpoints, different ideas about sustainable design. And in the process of this, the big question for me was how to understand how culture affects the understanding of how people are connected to nature in different ways, depending on their worldview. And it's very different. Nature shows up in one way or another. So that was very exciting right, to discover that there's not one nature, but many kinds of nature. And still I was left with some nagging questions. So we'll show, talk a bit more about the integral frame in just a minute, but basically that big question for me had to do with experience and how do people experience nature in buildings and cities? How do we design to create some architectural experience? And if people did have more experiences of nature, would they care more about it? So the more I questioned, the more I looked, the more it seemed that these questions were in the literature, really, it had very few answers. They just didn't seem to exist, at least not, not in my language. 
So to explore these questions, it was time for another book. That's basically the way I approach things is dig, dig a deep hole for myself and see if I, I can get out of it. And so about four years ago, I began a collaboration with a professor, Gail Brager from Berkeley. She's a building scientist and engineer. So we had this architectural perspective and the building science perspective, and we would somehow learn each other's languages and meet in the middle, hopefully, and integrate them. Uh, so what you see here is uh, one of several working titles. Uh, we're not quite sure what it'll be called. Uh, also a proposal for a book cover. Um, this is by Hansjörg Goritz. He's our book designer, one of my colleagues at Tennessee. And what you see here is the interior uh, ceiling of his parliament building in Liechtenstein. And so we had this insight that because people spend most of their lives inside buildings, right? I don't know what it is in Venice, maybe it's a little less than the US, for us, it's over 90% of the hours of your life is indoors. Here, you eat outside a bit more and you walk. So maybe it's 80% for you. But architecture then, because we spend so much time inside, is how we experience nature. And experiencing nature is so fundamental. So this work deals with some very fundamental issues issues about how architecture can be shaped to give people rich experiences of nature and natural forces. So I began to look for how other people, others who came before me, had thought about this topic, how they explained designing for architectural experiences. How was it they understood what we feel in buildings and how that connects us to nature and to natural forces. So I'll show you some examples, but I want to use one of the integral frameworks for placing these characters into some kind of um, perspective. So when I research any topic, I look through the lens of the integral model. I found it incredibly empowering. And the full integral model that you can read about in, in the Integral Sustainable Design book, um, the full model by the philosopher Ken Wilbert uses five different frameworks. Uh, we won't talk about those. This one is what we call quadrants. It's the most fundamental. And the world you can think of as uh, either uh, subjective or objective. So two basic distinctions here. The subjective, things that are invisible, that are interior to human beings. I must ask you about your attention or your comfort or what you think is beautiful. It's not obvious. On the other hand, the objective world, we can measure it, we can see it, we can map it, and so on. The second distinction is between the individual and the collective, the parts and the whole, the person and the society, for example. And this leaves us, or by these intersections, with four fundamental, essential views of almost anything. You can look at anything from these. So from this upper right perspective, I call this the perspective of behaviors. So that's how things work in the empirical world. The view of the engineer, the scientist, and so on. The systems perspective, very familiar to architects. I think of a plan or a building section as an organization of rooms. It's a complex system. You also have ecosystems and urban systems. In this view, we're very much interested in context. The culture's perspective is the realm of a collective interior or intersubjective. In that territory, ideas, myths, meanings, and so forth. Whoops, there we go, I went backwards. And finally, the subject really that we're up to today is the experiences perspective. That is the, the I territory, the individual. So let's look at these uh, four different ways of of asking the question, what is an experience of architecture? 
So first, in uh, Yuhani Palazma's classic where the eyes of the skin, he proclaims a sensory architecture with the body in the center. And he's interested in a multi-sensory inhabitation. It's no longer just the visually dominant world of modernism, but something that integrates all the senses in what he calls the human mode of being. And this is experience as individually lived phenomena. So you can think of Zumthor's thermal baths that exemplify this architecture of multiple senses. So Zumthor says architecture is experienced by the layman without thinking. He says, I want an emotional reaction. So here we have this first person, upper left viewpoint of experiences, the I perspective. What counts is your own individual perception of the world. On another perspective, the upper right, the behaviors realm, the territory I call it, right? It's you look at it from a third person as a scientist might. You have neuroscientists and the neuroscientists and architects are very interested in each other's fields and you have actually I found has a master's program that combines these two streams. So the goal of neuroscience is to understand how the brain perceives architecture and also to inform a design process that generates some positive responses. So like the phenomenologist, the body is important. It's foundational for some perception of architecture. So on one hand, the phenomenologists, palasma, et cetera, are interested in how it feels, and the neuroscientists are interested in, can they explain that feeling scientifically? So it's, again, the it perspective. So we have this uh, work by Fenn, for instance, um, who employs an experience-driven approach. I went there just this week, which actually exceeded my expectation. Uh, at the Biennale, so I, I recommend it. Very, very nice uh, project. And, and neuroscience is trying to explain how these effects that we get in a place like the Nordic Pavilion, uh, how, how those work on people's bodies and minds. So in this sense, from this perspective, we have an architectural emotion that can be thought of as actually a, a physiological response. It's pre-cognitive in the way they think of it. Anything higher, any thoughts are built on top of that. So the idea is that emotionally is one of the first ways that you experience architecture without even thinking about it. It's something deeply internal and bodily. I have a colleague, uh, Lance Levine, now ret retired. He was a professor at the University of Minnesota, and he wrote a book called Place Empathetic Design. And his idea is that experience is always situated in some particular place. And this idea of place empathetic design, it develops some architectural constructs that are rooted in the evolution of materials and the language of form that develops in a place, and then the community identity that goes along with that. So for instance, in this stamp museum here in Oaxaca, it uses courtyards as a kind of enduring structural pattern. It's rich in human experience and in cultural meaning. And once the, the, the patterns of climate and the patterns of materials and the patterns of forms begin to flow and work together, people inhabit those in certain ways in which the life activities begin to follow those rhythms. And then that place becomes uh, some kind of representation and meaning for the collective life of people. But it begins with the architecture responding to conditions that put it into a place. Now, a fourth approach, and you can see these are moving around the quadrants in this little diagram. So uh, Lance Levine and that in place empathetic approach, I would call that a culturally based approach. And here, this is the idea of prospect and refuge theory. So this fourth approach is using um, 
architectural experience that focuses on the spatial patterns that bring those forth. And there are forces that animate that from nature usually. So the prospect and refuge theory is this uh, psychological idea that comes out of a British geographer initially. And it's the idea that humans prefer and they seek places that offer the ability to survey the territory, that is prospect, and to have some safety without being seen, right? That's so you can, you know, see the bad guys coming up the hill in the, you know, the ancient village. That's the idea of refuge. And this, uh, this guy, Brant Hildebrand, he analyzed a series of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. This one is the Edward Cheney House and identified several features um, of prospect and refuge, this circuitous entry path where if you're a resident, you can see who's coming. You can see, you know, you can see the resident, the uh, visitor arriving. And a cave like hearth, something that provides enclosure with a low ceiling where you feel very protected. And then a view out through um, a, a kind of screened uh, view onto the landscape. And then once you're out there onto the terrace, moving through a transition space, you have a little wall to protect you and you're raised up on a platform, on a plinth, so you get a prospect, a view out to the open land. These are fundamental things that seem to come from our evolutionary past. I also love this uh, work, Archetypes in Architecture by Thomas Dias Evanson. Um, a book from the late 1980s uh, where he's taking up this question of how primary forms are correlated with our human psychology. And he developed this very detailed theory of archetypes and classifications and so forth. And it proceeds from the proposition that one core purpose of architecture is to generate feeling, occupant feeling or mood. And for example, we're all familiar with the idea of a sheltering roof with the isolating and enclosing roof form, and also with the contrasting experience of an extending horizontal roof that connects us outward to the horizon. Completely different kinds of responses based on a primary form. So now we can map these four approaches together. And we see Palasma's phenomenological approach as seen in Zumthor's thermal baths, where what counts is subjective individual feelings as experienced by a person. And on the other hand, in the upper right, the neuroscientists are objective. They're objective about the individual's brain and nervous system and body chemistry. And they look for explanations of psychology in its physical correlates. Dias Evanson, with archetypes, studied what's common to human feeling. As it can be felt, still feeling is the measurement, as it can be felt in the archetypal forms of architecture. And Levine interprets experience as bringing meaning to people that's grounded in some subjective, cultural, collective location in a place. And these are shaped by climate, materials, and the building practices of that particular local culture. So this analysis has helped me to stake out the important terrains that form the integral context of architectural experience as I've come to understand it. So what we experience begins with our individual sensations, the I perspective. It has to start there. But what we sense is some phenomenon, something, a distribution of conditions, I call it, in the it perspective, the upper right. And those conditions of nature and natural forces are then worked on and shaped by the organizations of architectural space. The architect is actually shaping the possibilities for experience from this complex it's, I call it a plural it, an it's perspective. So together, these upper right and lower right forces are working together to create 
some fields of experiential possibility in the upper left. That becomes what's possible for us. And our experiences then are interpreted and they're given meaning by the worldviews that we inherit, that we live within. That is the backgrounds of interpretation. That's the we perspective, the collective. So we can look at these in a little bit more detail. We have on the upper right the natural forces that are reshaped by the architectural space in the lower right to form patterns of conditions that we experience. So we don't experience architecture in the absence of light or air or heat or sound or moisture. Nature and architecture are colluding. They're working together to create the conditions for experience. And in the same way, we experience nature in buildings and through buildings. These are non-separate. We experience what I call event form. So something is happening, that's the event, and something is a form, the architecture. Right? Nature in buildings is another way to think about it as a unity. And this is, this is kind of like, this was a breakthrough in our thinking that it's fundamentally different from the idea that nature is somehow outside and building is inside. In the same way that nature is not just out in the rural landscape, in the agricultural territory or in the wilderness, right? but it's also in the city. So these nature plus building conditions set a field of possible experiences. I say possibilities. Why? Because they are possibilities because we cannot guarantee an individual's specific experience. Architecture, we can say, impels, but does not compel. It doesn't force us. It gives us the possibility, the opportunity. And once we have that experience, the same experience can be interpreted in different ways. For example, an engineer might see the light in a room and think of its quantity, its functionality, its measurements. An artist, on the other hand, might see the same light and look at its emotional effect or enjoy the subtlety of its color. So these are coming from some background of interpretation that's located in a culture or a subculture, and they color our meaning. They also constrain what's possible. It's very difficult for the engineer to focus on the emotional quality of the light, for example. It's very difficult for someone in Saudi Arabia to take the same perspective that someone in Finland does about the goodness of more light. So what we feel is not unlimited. We also had another thorny problem in this work. And this was the question of how to make sense of the variety of different ways that the body and, rem and, and the mind respond to inhabiting architecture. So I collaborated with a PhD student, Melanie Watchman from Laval University. She uh, gave one of the co-lectures with me that I talked about earlier. And we were looking into a question about biophilic experiences in buildings. And these diagrams that I'm gonna show you come out of that, that exploration. So biophilia means love of life. You may be familiar with this, this kind of current idea in architecture. And this idea of love or philia seemed a long way from these fundamental explanations of the neuroscientists. And so here's how we worked it out. We, we started with the idea that all human experiences begin with sensations, the stimuli in our environment, in our places that affect our sensory receptors, the eyes, the nose, the skin, et cetera. And what we sense is hot and cold, bright and dark, wet and dry, 
gradations of light, smoothness, roughness, and so on. Those are what the architect actually has to manipulate, those fundamental characteristics. And these sensations then are processed. This is kind of a synthesis of lots of different, try, my trying to understand this complex phenomenon. But sensations seem to be processed in complex ways by the body-mind. And they give rise to what in English we call affect. Um, I don't know if my translations, uh, with the help of Google, are, are right on target here or not. So please excuse if I get the words wrong. Um, but neuroscientists, they're suggesting that this architectural emotion precedes cognition. Uh, but this category category of the response to the sensations, I just call affect. So we can feel safety, we can feel playful or excited, we can feel surprised, or joyful or delighted, but we can also have cognitive uh, responses. We can think about our sensations also, and we can generate different mental states in those spaces. So we can be imaginative or curious, inspired, we can contemplate, and so on. Then there's a third level, and you can see that these, the idea is that these uh, different categories of sensations and experiences are nested one inside the other. One seems to somehow depend upon the other one and build in complexity. So the affect depends on the sensations and the understanding depends on both of them. If you take out the sensation, you don't get to understand it. So it's in some way a one-way vector, a one-way process, um, even though we're talking about relatively ephemeral, temporary states of being. And so there's no understanding of being in a place or nature in the absence of those sensations and feelings. Now, understanding can take the form of, for instance, our awareness of, or our knowledge about nature, or the recognition of a spatial order, or the perceiving of any larger patterns of phenomenon over time. And then finally, thinking again in biophilic terms, we hypothesize that affiliation, this philia in the biophilia, is dependent upon understanding. Affiliation, in some way, is the formation of a close relationship. And we think that there's no relationship, really, without knowing the thing that you are related to. It would be hard to have your significant other in a relationship if you never met them, right? You had no knowledge of them. So this is how we think it works. Um, and finally, maybe there's some uncovering of how to distinguish um, a, a rather sophisticated level of experience, like biophilia, from other orders of experience, like sensing hot and cold, which is also an experience. So affiliation can include a big category of things like empathy or bonding or connection or the sense of oneness or unity with nature or with the place. And these states, again, seem to build up in complexity. So another difficult question, and I will show you some architecture, so hang in there with the diagrams. Um, another difficult question for us became how to understand the world of the variable conditions that we experience. And this was especially important because we were fascinated by two kinds of potential shifts in architectural thinking. One was, and, and this has to do, I see it a bit less here than I see it at home, but contemporary architecture tends to be, have a steady state interior. And we were interested in how to shift to more dynamic conditions in time. It, is, it tends to have something that ideally doesn't change. The engineer likes to set a single temperature, for example, or a single lighting level for a whole space. 
And the second shift had to do with moving from uniform to non-uniform conditions. That is not having the conditions everywhere in the room or in the building be exactly the same. So instead of organizing our, our thinking and the, and the ideas of the project by issues like light and thermal and view, we arrived at organizing the work by six kinds of distributions of conditions that we could find in buildings. And these are the ways that we actually experience conditions that can be ordered in time and in space. And we call these distributions here, the first one, contrasts. These are sharp adjacent distinctions from one thing to another. We have gradient, which is the idea of smooth transitions from one condition to the other, such as the way the light is bright near a window and gets darker further away if there's only windows on one side. The idea of sequences, moving from one space to another with different conditions from one space and then moving to a new one. The idea of flux. Flux is a, we couldn't think of a better word, but um, it's maybe not perfect, but it's better than stochastic or random. So the idea that mostly a random kind of phenomenon, such as when the clouds are moving and the lights changing, or when the leaves are being blown on a tree by the wind, those are fluctuating circumstances. So where was I? Rhythms, like rhythms of the day, rhythms of the season, and so forth. We even mark our time based on the rhythms of the sun and the rhythms of the moon. And then finally, narratives, which require for their experience some symbolic interpretations from a story, some prior understanding of the phenomenon in order to make sense of it. So we, we took these ideas and we've developed about 45 experiential design schemas. And this is for the first edition of the, of the work. Each one of these is in a four page format. And these are intended as generative tools for preliminary design, that is, concept generating possibilities. Each schema follows a, the same format. It has a couple of elegant examples, some poetic introduction. We actually wrote an original haiku for each, each of these to get you in the space. Uh, some related supporting evidence, some design guidelines, importantly. And uh, we created a uh, hundred or so original drawings and diagrams. Here's what uh, one of those looks like. Um, and really I have to credit my colleague, Hansjur Goritz, who's our book designer for the elegant simplicity. Um, so this idea may seem like a simple notion, but bridging the left quadrants and the right side, the subjective and the objective into one shared language is actually incredibly challenging. Um, there are very few precedents for this, and none that we can find in English where things become actually have some utility for the architect beyond a narrative theory. So this is what this module uh, might look like, and it has the opener spread here with a, with a focus on introducing an idea and on showing some good examples. And then the second spread focuses on the details of the evidence and on the design guidance. And for the students, I, I posted a whole series of these that I thought might be relative, uh, relevant to your current project in uh, Professor Venore's class. So um, you can see the details that you can't read here. So here's the full index of the schemas. And you might note the blank boxes you can see that this is an incomplete knowledge base and it's intended to always be incomplete. So if we knew there was something there and we didn't know how to solve it, we just left it blank. And maybe some other researcher or maybe we'll come up with this idea in the future. So the idea is that you know experience is invisible. It's hard to represent. And typically in architectural language, we are very imprecise about experience. And for this reason, each of these schemas takes an evocative or a memorable name. We're trying to put a handle on it. And naming a pattern seems to bring it into existence. 
as something in a design vocabulary. If you can name the pattern, if you can diagram the pattern, then it's something that can enter into the process of design. The numbers that you see here refer to scales because an architectural experience is always located in some space. And the space actually has a scale. So we can begin to tie experience with scale. And we've organized these schemas into six nested levels of scale and complexity. And this space and scale are very interesting because they seem to have the characteristic of being able to connect all the perspectives that we've been talking about. And here you can see this is a really a work in progress. It's not quite finished. The, and what you see is only about half of the schemas that are uh, in the uh, completed work. And they're organized from at the bottom materials, el building elements, building systems like facades or structural systems, for instance, rooms, then organizations of rooms like plans and sections, and then whole buildings. And there's also a landscape equivalent of each of these and an outdoor equivalent also. So each of the schemas in this mapping is helping to build something larger, something larger than itself in a network. It always has a context and therefore it's both a whole and it's a part. And each, uh, each, of, each of the larger ones is also helping to organize the smaller schemas. Again, you see some empty squares. And these are schemas actually that we've named and identified. We think there's a good idea there, but we haven't finished the work on it, or we just think it's a good idea and we haven't done it yet. Um, but we're pretty sure that there's something there that needs to be filled in. And this, is, this kind of mapping allows us to find the gaps, allows us to find what's missing and where the next research agenda might be targeted. So there's a lot of work to be done. And this is how we've tried to build up the knowledge structure. And we, we think that this knowledge structure can be uh, evolving. And it's similar, it's actually trying to work together with the objective structure of my other work, Sun, Wind and Light, to really develop a, a kind of knowledge base and, and to map that and to say there is there are certain things about architecture that can be known and can be shared. That's not everything, but many things can be. So the idea is that this might be added to by other researchers and other designers, and that it could be simple enough to form the building blocks of design concepts. One of these is probably not going to organize your building, but some family can really generate, some family of schemas can potentially generate um, an overall approach to a project. So to give you just a few examples at a high level without some without all the detail, these uh, the, the first category is contrast schemas. And these have us experiencing opposing conditions very close to one another. This one is called water you can touch. It encourages hydrophilic behavior and provides an instant thermal delight. As humans, we're attracted to water. And you see a kindergarten in Japan where the rainwater in the court is held and retained on purpose for children's play. Scintillating sun, you see that we try to name these to make them somewhat memorable, we hope. Scintillating sun filters direct light to achieve dynamic, visually complex patterns, evoking a calm and primal nature moment. So we try to connect the space to, the, to some experience, to some phenomenon. Sunlight can be harsh, of course, but when we break it up and cast it onto surfaces, it can mark time. As the sun moves, it locates us at a place on the planet. It somehow makes visible the natural order that we live inside of. And in that order is a kind of rest. Inhabited periphery links distinct indoor and outdoor conditions by treating the building envelope as a thick, occupied zone. It's interesting that contrasting conditions 
Those are often best experienced with some kind of linking space or transitional space. And that allows people to choose, to find the condition that they prefer. And so like imagine a campfire on a cold night, it's just something primally satisfying, right? Really fundamentally satisfying about that balance between extremes. Gradients is a kind of distribution that establishes a smooth transition from one condition to another. And it can be the gradient of temperature or light, or in this case, sound. Euphonic water, we call this, the pleasure of the sound of water. In a small park in New York, employs a refreshing sound to establish a gradient, a sonic gradient, from the noise of the city to the delight of the waterfall. And the research actually shows us that moving water has a powerful psychological effect. This is Anant Raje, one of my favorite Indian architects, who used the term pockets of shadow, where he treats the building edge as a thick, sun-protected, layered zone that gives a sense of shelter and peace. And this is his Indian Institute of Forest Management. They have these wonderful universities that focus on one topic. And we see layers of shade uh, over outdoor rooms, rhythmic, dark, and lightness in the exterior circulation, and these thick zones at the building edges that protect the windows so the sun rarely, if ever, hits the glass. This one I call Shades of Brilliance, which generates subtle microclimates for inhabitants' pleasure and thermal choices. So here is the artist Georgia O'Keeffe's house, and she can choose here among full sun, partial shade, and full, sh full shade. Right? So some possibility of moving back and forth and finding your preferred moment. And this ability to choose just in itself, to migrate from one place to another or to control your conditions, actually is superior in its importance. Uh, it brings a kind of natural satisfaction. Even if you don't do it, even if you don't open the window, that you could open a window or that you could sit in the sun, makes you happier than if you do not have the choice. So in this case, as the sun moves around, there's the volume of three-dimensional shadow, and it's morphing. And while it's doing that, we can adjust our position. And in doing so, we're reconnecting to some aspect of our own primal nature. Um, someone in the class the other day mentioned the notion of a special place for a sunrise or a sunset. We call this one dawn and dusk places that focus attention of the occupants on the light and the color transitions in that period around sunrise and sunset and also with the lunar rise and set. I love the Greeks. They come, there's all kinds of Greek words in English. Heliophile, for instance, is a sun lover and selenophile, named for the moon goddess Selene, they find the moon captivating. But it turns out we all do. There's something really universal about watching that change happen. At the beginning and the end of each day as the sun rises and sets, you can observe these dramatic shifts in color and light intensity. The golden hour that you see on the left and that's followed in the evening by the blue hour, as we see on the right, along with the moon set. And then in the morning, that whole process does exactly the same thing, but in reverse. So these kinds of timings and rhythms and orientations have been known for thousands of years, yet mostly forgotten by modern people everywhere. You remember if I say, where does the sun rise? Now you may know the answer, but most architecture students have no idea. If I ask you where the moon rises, you probably still are wondering, where does the moon rise? And that's easy to find out. So anyway, much of our work is to translate from a language of science, 
a language of engineering into a designer-friendly language, and then to develop some original graphics like these that reveal the patterns, these patterns that can be useful to designers. The category of flux is this stochastic or more random pattern, and they can include uh, water, wind, light, or combinations of these. Call this one water animated surfaces, and the idea is that it receives dancing sunlight reflections from water when it's disturbed by the wind. So the surface changes, and you get convex and concave reflections. Like you see here in this detail of the Porsche Pavilion in Germany, where the light's reflecting off of a lake onto this compound overhanging curved surface. We're here in Kingo Kuma's cherry, water cherry house in Japan. So it's a house surrounded by water. And look at those lovely reflections. Suzanne and I experienced this when we lived on a boat for a, a number of years. And we can also see this in Venice, where you find it by chance. Let's see if this will go if I click on it. Ah, there we go. And with so much with so much water near buildings, it could also not just be by chance, but by design. Revealed conveyance expresses the movement of rainwater from catchment to storage and manifests the hydrologic process in daily life. Did you know a building is actually a part of the hydrologic process? Moving water is very moving emotionally also. We're fascinated by it. And when the rainfall conveyance, that is, you know, the, the, the way that the of the water is channeled and taken away from a building, when that's exposed to the view, then the occupants can engage in and they can relate to that natural process. It's a form that's telling um, as you see here in the Francis Carey's project in, in Africa. And somehow in this awareness, there's this secure pleasure and belonging to something larger. An experiential sequence is an intentional shift in sensory experiences as we move through a series of spaces. And you can think about this as experience, you can also think about it as spatial order. And in this case, the, the experience and the spatial order are very much tied together. So we can use light to reinforce the form of the architecture. It's a kind of design world in which the conditions are not steady state, not monotonous. So here, we call this light and dark procession. It could be not this one, it could be in a variety of different conditions, but the idea is that this, uh, you have a variety of light intensity varying between spaces that help to define the significant features of the architecture and also are enlivening your own experience. So here in this museum by Henning Larsens in Denmark, the exhibits are dark or darker, and the circulation spaces are bright and skylighted. And the visitor goes through a sequence that begins here in this kind of Egyptian crypt that you see on the left, and then alternates between the exhibits and the brighter circulation space, back and forth three times. And as they're doing this, they're also moving up from low to high. So the, the light is getting brighter and brighter as you go up, and then it arrives at a sunlit roof terrace with a view of the city. Our experiences are also characterized by how we interpret that through narratives. So the, the, the conditions can be static. They don't have to be changing, like when you experience a breeze, for instance. You're, and this is maybe the most um, familiar to architects, uh, I think, maybe, that we call this idea roof terrain, the idea that it can be shaped to collect rainwater and to direct it to storage, so it has a, a functional aspect but also visibly is narrating the building's role in the hydrologic cycle. 
the building I work in is like the size of a giant aircraft carrier, a big ship, but you can't see a drop of the rainwater and you never hear it either. On the other hand, I would argue that we are connected to nature when we understand and celebrate the ways that the things we build as human beings are integrated with nature's process. So much of what we know about nature is from how our technologies, including our building technologies, are interacting with it. So nature's process in this mode becomes manifested visibly. The three realms is a schema that's a narrative, and it, the idea is to connect occupants to the diverse natural and symbolic worlds of the subterrain, that is the underground, the surface, and the sky. Very timeless notions. In this house for a bird watcher by the American architect Antoine Predock, metaphorically you enter into the earth through the stone of a cave that you see on the lower left. The ground level then, when you arrive, as you see on the lower right, the ground level opens onto a view of the forest with stairs that ascend to a bridge for observation, so you get multiple levels. And then the upper left shows a sky ramp that projects out into the canopy of the trees clearly for a bird watcher, right? And then the, the procession ends on the roof with this enclosed terrace that frames a view of the sky upward, um, perhaps for watching flying birds, but also uh, very much intended for watching the stars at night. So these are just a few of the schema ideas that we have developed. There's hundreds of more possible. And this graphic here is a demonstration and an invitation. This is uh, some work from uh, Melanie Watchman that I mentioned earlier in her PhD research at Laval, and she was developing biophilic design schemas. So she's used the same knowledge structure and a system of scales to develop a more comprehensive language, one that's bigger, a bigger project than uh, anyone could have done alone. So the colored circles here are, does that show up well? Yes, it does. The colored circles represent the schemas that she is developing. And the gray circles are schemas from the work that I've been showing you. So she's taking her work and integrating it into this larger language. And so the demonstration is that different but related research by different researchers can add up to something greater. And this is actually very rare. Usually we're all looking for our own individual project, our own individual expression. But architecture is also something that is a, a knowledge that can be shared. So to make this kind of idea work, I think there's three things for the researchers in the room. Um, number one, a shared vision, an intention, with questions that are larger than any individual. If the question you can complete and answer on your own, it's not big enough. Second, a knowledge structure, something that allows the research questions and all of the products of that research to be connected, to be related, so that you can see what is the whole that this is contributing to. And then third, somehow framing the results in portable ways, in ways that can be shared, in ways that have that knowledge be applied to more than one project. So the invitation then is to join this integral approach, this design and research game, and to help improve it and to create some collective contributions. Also on the YouTube channel, you can find this video, which is part of a photo exhibit that I collaborated on with the excellent Greek photographer, Pygmalion Karatsis, and I've shown a few of his, uh, his images today also. And the video shows a series of design schemas. This was part of developing the early ideas of this project. 
And if you're interested uh, on the YouTube channel, look for part four of the series. It's called The Feeling of Form. I'd like to finish by explaining something about why I think experience is important. For me, it's very simple. Life is made up of a series of events that we experience. These events are mostly ones that also happened yesterday. The everyday events are the qualities of our lives. And architecture, as I hope you have seen today, can shape those events and can qualify our experience. So many buildings today, though, isolate us from nature. And if buildings can shape these repeated events of nature as rich experiences, then architecture has the possibility to reconnect the inhabitants of our buildings to nature. And people related to nature through this everyday delight and pleasure come to know nature again. In this knowing is the ethic for care and support. So in this knowing of the everyday of being reconnected to nature exists the possibility of an ethic for care and support of nature. In this way, I believe that architecture also has the ability to help solve the climate crisis. This is the important question of our time. And it's also an enduring art. You can certainly see that in Venice. As an enduring art, it has the capacity to sustain that long-term cultural shift in perception and in meaning. That is the only way that we get to solving that climate crisis in the long term. So that's why I think even this idea of the ephemeral experience is actually something critical. Thanks very much for your kind attention.